um, thank those of you who came out tonight. And uh, Ben, thank you very, very much for that uh, great introduction. I do a lot of speaking around the country, and I'm, I'm on a uh, speaking tour right now, too. So I came in from uh, the weekend. I was um, speaking in uh, the Columbus and Dayton area. I'm going to go home to Albuquerque, where I think it will be a little warmer uh, tomorrow than off to Las Vegas. But um, I always feel like I never got the, ch the chance to go to Boston College, but I, I for some reason, feel like this is, this is home. And I know it's a Jesuit school, but uh, it's been a very welcoming environment. And um, I'm very grateful to BC, to the Chancellor, and certainly to Ben uh, for being able to come back here and to talk. I know we're, uh, we're being televised tonight, and we're, they're taping this, so I know it'll be a larger audience that will have a chance to hear what we're going to do. I'm going to just talk fairly briefly and then see if there's any. I know that I do this a lot, and there's a lot of questions uh, that people have, and uh, that tends to be a, um, the better part of this. Um, by way of, uh, of, of announcing how we started, uh, it was, I really have to thank Mel Gibson, because when his movie came out uh, seven years ago this month, and I, I forget the name, I, I think it was The Jesus Chainsaw Massacre or Freddy vs. Jesus, as I like to refer to it. Um, I had three kids at the academy at the time, my two Jewish sons and my future uh, daughter-in-law, who is, who is a Christian and still is a Christian. Uh, and the uh, incredible amount of pressure that was being put on the cadet wing, which is like the student body at Best, uh, Boston College, it's called the Corps of Cadets at West Point, um, the Brigade of Midshipmen at Annapolis was just unbelievable. I mean, you couldn't look at, at uh, uh, the cadets march in and stand and, and look in front of their plates in the huge indoor dining facility known as Mitchell Hall, and every plate had a poster for this movie. If you went into the academic building, which was called Fairchild Hall, the walls were postered with it, uh, plastered with this wherever you went. Making a long story short, and I, I do talk about this uh, in, uh, in my book, I began to realize that, you know, well, Houston, we have a problem here, right? And uh, I went and, uh, and tried to talk with the, it wasn't even my own kids that reached out to me. They, they, they were just so into the fact this is the way it is here. And again, this is the U.S. Air Force Academy where it costs $416,000 to put a cadet through the academy. That's, that's your dollars and your parents' dollars and your children's dollars. Um, for about nine months, I tried to work with the academy. Uh, I, for me, it had been a, a very much of a, of a transcendent type of experience being there before I realized that at some point you have to stop when someone's pissing in your face and you know telling you that it's raining all the time. Um, seven years later I stand before you as something called a civil rights, uh, uh, not activist, but fighter. Uh, we represent almost, it'll, next week it should go over, or the week after, we'll go over 22,000 active duty United States Marines, sailors, soldiers, airmen, cadets and midshipmen at West Point, the Air Force Academy in Annapolis, reservists, National Guardsmen, Coast Guardsmen, veterans, and please listen to this, 96% of our clients are Protestants and Catholics. That 96% breaks down to where about three-fourths of that number are Protestants of pretty much every major, every denomination. I mean, we have 21 different varieties of Baptists alone. Um, the other one-fourth are Roman Catholic. Uh, so only 4% of our clients are Jewish or Muslim, Buddhist, Hindu, atheist, Native American, spiritualist, uh, you know, again, atheist, agnostic, what, what have you, um, uh, Shinto, uh, uh, and it's, it's just astonishing. Our, our Christian clients that are you know, fighting for, uh, fighting wearing the uniform are being told that they're not Christian enough. I've also come to realize that it's not a problem. It wasn't right to say, Houston, we have a problem. It's not an issue. It's not a challenge that we're talking about on this Tuesday night. It really is a national security threat. When I have 47 uh, uh, some odd United States you know, military uh, nuclear launch officers who are calling me because their commander has made it clear that should they receive the order to launch from President Obama or anybody else in the National Command Authority, and there aren't that many, that they are, they are ordered uh, to spend a minimum of 30 seconds reaching out to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to see whether Jesus would comply with the launch order, that isn't a problem. It's not, a, you know, the, uh, the Nobel Peace Prize nominations are great, but it, um, you know, that's not given for the support we're giving to our troops. That's given because you, know, you have to be able to show that you're increasing the fraternity between nations. So we're, we're dealing with, uh, with so many Iraqis and Afghans and Pakistanis who are being mercilessly proselytized by our U.S. military. And it's not really even just our U.S. military. Do some of you remember the famous um, speech by Eisenhower? His most famous speech was his farewell speech. What did he warn America about? Anybody remember? The military-industrial complex. What we at MRF, MRFF, or the Military Religious Freedom Foundation, know that we're facing is really a fundamentalist Christian parachurch military corporate proselytizing complex. We see, um, we see it alive and well in the huge defense contractors, Lockheed Martin, Boeing, Northrop Grumman. Um, 
the parachurch organizations, Campus Crusade for Christ, military ministries, it's a half billion dollar budget. You know, our budget is, is somewhere in a little bit around, our dream budget would be probably seven or eight hundred grand a year. We try to operate on half a million dollars a year, a little bit more than that. You know, our, our numbers are online. Uh, and uh, I'm the biggest expense. I'm, I'm the guy that has to be has to lead this. I'm our press person. I'm our our um, our lead litigator. I'm our um, uh, intake person for all of our soldiers and sailors, Marines, and airmen. And our family is kind of the perfect family to be fighting this. Half my family is Christian. Half of it is Jewish. Um, we've had 130 uh, combined uh, years in my immediate family of active duty military service and pretty much every major combat engagement the country's been in from. Um, um, I can go back to the Revolutionary War, the War of 1812, uh, World War, you know, certainly the Civil War, uh, World War I, all the way to this global war on terror. My nephew David got back just today from his fourth combat tour. He's a, he's a Marine gunnery sergeant. He was in, um, in uh, the southern part, Helmand Province in Afghanistan. And, uh, uh, you know, I know the religious right would love it if they could, you know, somehow show the Weinstein family uh, as being, you know, Northern California, uh, Chardonnay sipping, tree hugging, bleeding heart, liberal Democrats. Not that there's anything wrong with that, you know, to whack Seinfeldian. Um, there isn't. But we're not. Our family tends to be conservative. You know, I am a Republican. I happen to have, you know, voted for Clinton twice, Gore, Kerry, and Obama. But as, uh, as my brother Ben said, uh, the Republican Party left me. I didn't leave it. It seems as though Democrats have moved to the right, of course, and, uh, and the Republicans have moved into the insane asylum. Um, and um, but uh, this isn't a political fight. Our fight is focused on the U.S. Constitution. We don't. Uh, it's easy to denigrate us as being anti-Christian, except that our largest, or besides the fact that almost all of our staff of 75, most of whom are are full-time volunteers, um, most of our board and advisory board, most of uh, our clients, and most of our donors, of course, are Catholic or Protestant. The largest in, uh, organizational uh, endorsing agency that supports our foundation is the California Council of Churches, Impact Group, which is 21 different Protestant denominations, 5,500 Protestant congregations, individual congregations in, in, um, in California, and millions of California Protestants. Uh, so this isn't a question of, uh, it's, you know, and if my last name wasn't Weinstein, but was Smith or Jones, 99% of the crap that comes in on the telephone or it happens to, uh, on, the, on the Blackberry, the stuff that I had that, that Ben took a quick glance at before we walked in here today, um, the fact that these wonderful uh, uh, law enforcement folks from, the, from um, um, Boston College Police Department and the detectives are here wouldn't have to happen. But it's just easy to say, well, you know, he's Jewish. And we all know what that means. He's Jewish. And uh, the irony is, is that most of the Jewish organizations don't support us. We, have an, we don't have a good relationship with the Anti-Defamation League. You know, I guess let me make it clear. I'm, I'm standing before you on this Tuesday night not as an American Jew. I'm not. Maybe somebody else is. I'm not an American Jew. I'm a Jewish American. There's a difference. One is a noun and one is a, as an adjective. You know, I don't wake up each day wondering what's happening in Israel. Israel's a, a good ally for us. Uh, when I objected uh, strenuously to what happened uh, in Gaza, uh, uh, you know, suddenly I was a self-hating Jew. Uh, the Anti-Defamation League I refer to often as the Apologist Defense League. Uh, we've, we've, uh, we've fought for Jewish uh, members of the military and the ADL doesn't lift a finger. I'm sure we got off on the wrong foot. Um, some of you may know Abraham Foxman is the head of the ADL and uh, uh, it was several years ago I think he sent me an email that said, you know, why do you have to be so nasty to them, Mikey? You're just going to make them matter at us, which uh, um, he meant the religious right. and. Uh, uh, I guess I responded maybe a little too quickly by saying, I think, Abe, you've confused the two Jewish concepts of circumcision and castration. Um, so yeah, we're fighters. We're going to stand up and, uh, and fight this as hard as we possibly can. Uh, I don't care what APAC, the American-Israel Political Action Committee, or the ADL says. Our colleagues tend to be the uh, Southern Poverty Law Center, certainly Americans United for the Separation of Church and State. Um, we have some religious organizations that support us. The Columbus, Ohio Jewish Foundation is a big supporter. I mentioned the California Council of Churches. But we're pretty much alone. Um, we focus with laser-like precision where all the conventional laser-guided and nuclear weapons are. Um, and that's the technologically most lethal organization ever created by humankind, which is our U.S. military. Um, some of you are parents. Some of you, probably everybody out there has parents. But uh, when you're kids, are, are being called, you know, fucking Jews and being accused of complete and total complicity in the execution of Jesus Christ, if you have a set, you're going to stand up and fight. And that's what I did. It wasn't, it wasn't that hard to leave behind uh, 
I, at, when I started this, I was, I guess, by American standards, pretty wealthy. And now I don't think anyone, I don't know anyone, including anybody in this room, that has a lower net worth than I do. Uh, I mean, it, it was quite, a way, quite an awakening feeling to meet with a bankruptcy attorney about a year, year and a half ago. We're not bankrupt yet, but I've actually found something worthwhile going bankrupt over. If I have to end up living in a cardboard box in Albuquerque, where I, where I live, under a freeway, I'll feel good about it. You know, I've actually, I mean, I'm, they're going to kick me out of the international Jewish conspiracy for saying this, but, you know, in addition to, the, I've been caught, you know, you know, you know, paying retail a few times as well, but uh, I'm going to tell you now, it's uh, uh, standing up and helping other people is important. Because when you tell people, ladies and gentlemen, and particularly in the U.S. military, which is where our fight is, that you lack integrity, character, knowledge, trustworthiness, courage, honor, ability, and honor because of your chosen religious faith, or lack thereof. Why, there's no difference between that and telling somebody you're stupid because of the color of your skin or because you're a woman. Do you understand? Now, I don't know how many people in this room have ever actually truthfully spoken truth to power. It's hard to do it. To a parent, to a, a boyfriend, a girlfriend, a spouse, to a, a professor, particularly to somebody who is your boss. It's very hard to speak truth to power. And in the, in the U.S. military, even if you're being gently evangelized by your military superior, you know, get the hell out of my face, sir or ma'am, is not an option for you. You can't do that. You, you turn yourself into a tarantula on a wedding cake, and we all know how long those last. So why do they come to our foundation? There's two reasons. The first is nature abhors a vacuum. In the military, if you're enlisted and you're being persecuted because of your religion, most of our clients are Protestant, the next biggest hunk happen to be Catholic, um, you can try going up your chain, but their chain of command is generally the one that's persecuting you. That's not going to work. You can try going to the chaplains, but the chaplains are about 84% fundamentalists, or evangelicals at least, and I'll explain that a little bit later. So that's not going to be helpful. You can try going to the JAGs. I was one for 10 years, the military lawyers. It's not what you see on TV, the, uh, the TV show, the Navy show about, uh, about JAGs. Um, their staff officers, they're not going to be any help at all. You can try going to the inspector general and also to the MEO, the military version of the EEO office. But then, of course, you're going to have to go on the record there. And those, that has never worked for any of our clients, ever. So they come to us because we offer them AARP, not the one that you're thinking about. We offer them, you know, anonymity, action, results, and protection. We're extremely militant, extremely militant organization. That's why I say I'm not a, I'm not a I think the press started calling me a number of years ago a, a civil rights um, gadfly. And I moved from gadfly to activist, and now from activist to fighter. Um, this is a hardball, uh, bloody business, standing up for civil rights. And the people on the other side are enormously um, well-funded and well-organized. And uh, I think it was Gandhi who said about civil rights activism that in its four phases. In the first phase, they ignore you. The second phase, they ridicule you. The third phase, they fight you. And in the fourth phase, you win. But we are definitely beyond ignore and ridicule. You know, we're definitely into fight. And it's, and it's, it's, it's very ad hominem. Um, I get called everything from being too short, too bald, too excessively um, emotional, too passionate, way too Jewish, not Jewish enough, hating Jesus. Um, I, I, I forget what it all is, but it, see, it's, and I, as I keep telling people, perhaps someone thinks I'm running for office. I'm, I'm not doing that at all. I'm simply carrying a message, and the way we fight is not with bullets or with um, you know, you know, ro rocket propelled grenades. We go into court, federal and state court, and we go into the media, and I talk all over the country. And um, that's what we do. Boston College has been uniquely receptive to us. And this is, again, as I said, a Jesuit school. This is an extremely, I'm not going to be happy tonight until I leave you unhappy. Because, you know, I, I was reading something the other, uh, the other day. It was called an article called uh, The Monkey Sphere. And uh, there's been some incredible anthropological research done on monkeys, on the size of their brains. The smaller the brain, the less number of monkeys a monkey can care about. They extrapolated this to human beings, saying that it looks like the, the, the maximum number of fellow human beings that human beings can care about is about 150. We can't go beyond that, because we, we're just not wired to go beyond that. Because if we do, we wouldn't be able to, we saw the tsunami that happened, we saw what happened in Haiti. If we felt the same way about all those people that we do about the 150 we care about, we couldn't survive. That doesn't mean that you still can't get off your asses and do something. But I really, that really kind of rocked my world. You know, that and... Uh, Having uh, uh, being told that our foundation is like a submarine, meaning that no one ever knows where we are, and that causes a great degree of deterrence, which is, uh, which is very positive. I was supposed to be speaking here, I think it was a week ago, but I was in federal district court in Colorado Springs trying to get a preliminary, uh, in Denver, trying to get a preliminary injunction to stop the Air Force Academy's 
National Prayer Luncheon uh, because they were having the commanders force people to go to this thing, although they claimed it was voluntary. And the speaker was a Marine who it was illegally wearing his uniform, and he was a Vietnam veteran who likes to claim that USMC stands for U.S. Marines for Christ, and that um, irrespective of wherever your morals are, you're still going to go burn eternally in hell unless you accept his particular version of weaponized Christianity. Let me make it clear who we're fighting. We are not fighting Christianity. It's like saying that we're fighting all of Islam when, when in fact we're fighting Wahhabist fundamentalist Islam. I used to think um, that there, was just, there were just two worlds of Christianity. There was a river down the middle, and to the west of the river was the main line or progressive uh, Christians and Catholics, uh, Protestants and Catholics. And they follow something called the Great Commandment, which Jesus talks about in his Sermon on the Mount in the book of Matthew, which is basically, love the Lord your God with all your mind, soul, and heart, and the Golden Rule, which can actually be derived from the Code of Hammurabi, right? Which is, treat everybody the way you want to be treated. It's the Great Commandment. Then you cross the river to the east, and that's where, we, where I thought we found all of our enemies, the evangelicals and the fundamentalists. I, the subtitle of my book that Ben told you about is, you know, is uh, with God on our side, one man's war against an evangelical coup in America's military. But that was so 2005. The book came out in 2006. I didn't realize that there was another river. On the east side of that river, on the left side, remember, we have mainline and progressive Christians. On the, on the east side, we've got the evangelicals and fundamentalists. But our largest growth area is with evangelical Christians coming to us on our boards, our advisory board, our, our, as donors and uh, certainly as clients. There's a second river. What divides evangelicals and fundamentalists? Well, first of all, let's remember that evangelicals and fundamentalists do not follow the Great Commandment as their prime directive. They follow something called the Great Commission, which is, you can be found in Mar uh, Mark 16, 15, and Matthew 28, 19. It's one of the last things Jesus is supposed to have said to his disciples, which is go and make disciples of all nations. In other words, make Christians like me. That's higher to them the evangelicals and fundamentalists than just the great commandment is, which is much more mellow and, and chill comparatively. But the evangelicals will say, yes, uh, I want to, you know, I have this zeal, Mikey, to convert everybody to becoming a Christian like me and my brothers and sisters who are fundamentalists, but I have to comport that zeal in accordance with the time, place, and manner restrictions put forth by the U.S. Constitution and its construing federal and state case law. That's why so many, even evangelicals, are coming to us, like what happened last week in Denver. The one, the one, we had 222 clients at the Air Force Academy on staff who came to us. None would come forward except for one, one professor named David Mullen, an evangelical Christian. When you cross that second river, you get into the area that we're fighting, the fundamentalist Christians, many other names, Reconstructionists, Dominionists, Premillennial, Postmillennial, Pre-Tribulation, Mid-Tribulation, Post-Tribulation. But their view is that there is no time, there is no place, there is no manner in which you can stop them. I mean, they'll scream Jesus in a crowded theater. They want to see a theocracy in this country. They'll scream that America was founded as a Christian country. And you know what? I'll agree with them. America was founded as a Christian country. Ah, but not the United States of America. There was a big difference between the Massachusetts Bay Colony and what happened in 1776. They don't like to hear when I say this, but you know what, what's the first commandment of the Ten? You remember that one? You can't have any other gods but me. And what's the First Amendment? Oh, yes, you can. Christianity has no special legal significance in our country under its legal system, any more than Satanism does. That's not how we set it up here. It's not set up that way here. So our fight is against about 12.6% of the American public. The numbers can be a little bit hard to nail down. We think it's about a third of the U.S. military, which is huge when you figure that, uh, that um, Hitler only had 7.9% in his National Socialist Movement. Stalin had 2.8%. By a show of hands, anybody in here ever been in the U.S. military? Okay. Thank you for your service to begin with. I get this a lot when people say, you know, Mikey, I was in. I never saw any of this. And um, my response is generally, uh, and I, I, I know they're not lying, my response is generally, okay, you live in Boston. I understand that in the history of Boston, there have been murders and rapes and armed robberies. How many of, the, of you have personally witnessed those on a regular basis? You know, oftentimes, you're, I say fish in an aquarium never see the water. You know, this, this is something that is, um, can be described, as I said before, it's a fanatical religiosity, fundamentalist or dominion Christianity, mixed in with actual weapons of mass destruction. We have them, thank God, the other side doesn't yet. 
mixed in with a misguided and tortured patriotism, further mixed in with a complete abrogation of the oath that everyone in the military takes, they swear not to support some weaponized gospel of Jesus Christ, but the United States Constitution, mixed in with completely unfettered access because of the draconian specter of military command influence. You can't understand it unless you want somebody who raised their hand. You cannot understand the way a man cannot understand what it feels like to have a child, as my wife told me over and over again. I mean, I, I, I thought it was like having a bad case of indigestion, but I was told that's not the case. Unless you're in the military, you don't know what it feels like to have some, a superior over you. You don't know how, that's not just your shift manager at Starbucks. Continuing on uh, with our sentence, further mixed in with the complete dearth of any restraint, oversight, and supervision. And ladies and gentlemen, what you have is a raging national security threat that almost nobody believes exists unless you're complicit. That's what we fight on, not a daily basis, but a minute by minute basis. It's enormous. If you give me 600, 600, 600, 600 seconds, 10 minutes, go back before you go to bed tonight, look at our website, militaryreligiousfreedom.org. It's real easy, militaryreligiousfreedom.org. Look at our video. We don't just have journalists embedded in our combat units in Iraq and Afghanistan, mostly Afghanistan now. We have American fundamentalist Christian missionaries who are passing out the New Testament written in Pashtun, Dari, Arabic, and Swahili. Do you remember General Tommy Franks, our first commander over there? Any of you remember the name? Tommy Franks was our first commander. He promulgated Standing General Order 1 Alpha, which is now called Standing, the nomenclature is 1 Beta, one beta now, or 1 Bravo, it's 1 B, which is a complete prohibition on the proselytizing of any religion, faith, or practice. And yet this, this, this uh, 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 standing general order, and anybody violates it, it's a violation of Article 92 of the Uniform Code of Military Justice. It's a felony. And yet it is, it is observed far more in its um, breach than in its conformance. Remember, the military is a different organization. Having sexual intercourse with someone other than your spouse, adultery, is still routinely punished as a felony in the military. I've tried and defended those cases. If you're told to go to the base dentist at 4 p.m. and you don't go, it's a felony. Why? M many constitutional rights for our members of the military are severely abridged. That's in order to support the higher goal of providing good order and discipline so that our military members have the, the, the requisite level of uh, lethality to protect the full panoply of constitutional rights for the rest of us. So that makes it particularly difficult if you're a, a subordinate and your military superior. It can be something that appears to be um, nuanced, like, hey, uh, the, 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 uh, the company commander says, I'm just going to burn some burgers. We have a few brews this Sunday at my house. Have a little fellowship about Jesus. Don't feel like you have to come, but please, you know, please feel free to come over to the house. Sounds perfectly innocuous. It's not. Or it can be the situation where you're on your fourth combat tour in Afghanistan and you're told you cannot join, if you're Catholic, you cannot join uh, your unit unless you fall down and, and, and uh, disavow your Catholicism and accept a particular version of Christianity. You have two weeks to make that decision. In the meantime, you're, you're given a Dixie cup, tweezers, and you're going to go to the latrine until you fill the Dixie cu cu cup up with pubic hairs, until it's overflowing, or you accept Jesus. I've got thousands of stories, some of which are just, um, they're incredibly heartbreaking, um, and there isn't enough time tonight to go into even a small amount of those, but if you go on the website, you'll see it. Uh, it's, it's great to have these Nobel Peace Prize nominations, that's wonderful, but it's only wonderful to the extent that it, that it manifests itself in buttressing the gravitas of what our organization is about. Um, civil rights activism is hard, uh, and our civil rights fighting is even harder. Uh, you've got to be there at all times because when our clients come to us, they're not complainants, ladies and gentlemen. You know, they are spiritual rape victims of fundamentalist Christian predators. And I mean that in every sense of the word. Can you believe that, you know, that most Americans have no clue in this docile and supine country that we've unfortunately become, um, you know, filled with Marge and Homer Simpsons. I mean, I want to watch my Dancing with the Stars and what's happening on American Idol. Most, most Americans have very little clue about the separation of church and state. They have far less clue, even the American bar, most lawyers don't even, re don't even realize about Clause 3, Article 6. Because remember, the, the, the First Amendment is the First Amendment of the Bill of Rights, which was passed when? March of 1791. Fifteen months earlier, in December of 1789, the body of the Constitution was, was passed. And our, our constitutional founding framers were so assiduously careful to separate metaphysical and physical, spiritual and temporal, church and state, 
that they stuck in Clause 3, Article 6, where it says we will never have a religious test for any position in the federal government. Not here. They had looked at European history where most of the tyrannies that had occurred had been when men of the cloth had been men in political power. They looked at Cromwell in England. They looked at the Salem witch trials. They said, we're not going to do that here. And yet on Tuesday, July 12, 2005, on the front page of the newspaper, most despised by the Pentagon, it's not the Boston Globe, by the way. What newspaper do you think that would be? The New York Times. The, the, uh, the Air Force's uh, number two chaplain, Brigadier General Cecil R. Richardson, uh, shortly thereafter promoted by the great George W. Bush to the head Air Force chaplain, which he is today. He's now a major general. Uh, announced a new policy statement. So you know it had, to, it had to be fully vetted if it's on the front page of the, of the newspaper. Uh, it was a Laurie Goodstein article uh, that's most hated by the Pentagon. The U.S. Air Force said our new policy is, is that we, we reserve our right to evangelize anyone we determine to be unchurched. So the U.S. Air Force, the, all the services do it. Well, hold like I guess, a religious Geiger counter up to everybody. Those of you in TV land, those of you here tonight, and if it comes back and says that you're anything other than this amorphous thing called unchurched, why the United States Air Force, your United States Air Force, reserves the right not to Buddhize or Hinduize or Judaize or atheize or agnosticize or Catholicize you or Judaize you, but to evangelize you. And now, because of the rampant pandemic of, of suicides in the U.S. military, we have a new thing called spiritual fitness. The Army has just finished doing this to almost, almost a million of its soldiers. You sit down and take a computer test, a test among other things. It's part of something called comprehensive Soldier Fitness, I just did ABC World News tonight a couple days ago on this. I think I hope it'll air this weekend with, uh, with Diane Sawyer um, or Dan Harris. Uh, it's uh, the Global Assessment Tool, the Spiritual Fitness Test. And we, we have over 300 Army soldiers that have come back to us because they failed the test. They, have, they are not spiritually fit enough. I was talking to Ben about this. If Boston College did that here, do you know how many heads would roll? And this, this, this is, you know, th this is a Jesuit... <laughs> Jesuit uh, you know, center of higher learning. But this is the U.S. Army. The argument is, well, we're just trying to stop our soldiers from killing each other, or killing themselves. Yeah, I get that. Yeah, that, that's a very admirable thing. But trying to determine, um, and it's not a question about, hey, it's, and they, uh, the, the Army is very big on saying, well, we don't mean religiosity, we mean spirituality. But of course, uh, uh, we are represented by the world's largest law firm, Jones Day. We will shortly be suing the U.S. Army. When, whenever the Army uh, 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 gives its excuses for this latest thing that we're on, that we're fighting them on, uh, and the press comes to me saying, well, Mikey, the Army said this, 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 and this, I always respond with the same thing, saying, you know, I only have five words to say to the Army. And they say, well, how can you respond in five words? They, they've put, uh, put out a four-page memo about why you're wrong about the spiritual fitness test. My five words are just tell it to the judge. Don't tell it to ABC, CBS, NBC, and Fox. We'll see you in court. That's all they understand. They have two, Achille two Achilles heels uh, with the Pentagon, uh, as I refer to call it, I prefer to call it the Pentecostal gun, which is you know the media and going into court. As I said before, it's way beyond the scope of going. Uh, of, of, of the story is a um, is a difficult story to tell. It's uh, it's a living, breathing, metastasized cancer of unconstitutional fundamentalist Christian exceptionalism, triumphalism. Uh, supremacy. Uh, I know people go about their, you know, their, look, we're almost getting into March Madness and we're going to, we've got classes tomorrow and there's tests and things, but we actually have to do something now. You can't just sit back and be silent. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's actually happening and that's what we fight every day and that's why I'm trying to, is going out and kind of like Johnny Appleseed spreading the message so that at least you've heard this and you've been pre-inoculated against what's actually happening. Uh, or you've been pre-inoculated so that you can understand why it is that we're doing what we're doing. Uh, our donors include everything from the Rockefeller family to, to privates who give us five bucks, ten bucks a month. Uh, we're a nonprofit charity. Everything is, an, is, a, uh, is a tax deduction, but it's a hard, hard fight, and uh, we won't stop doing it. Ultimately, when people say, well, Mikey, what is it you really want with MRF, M -R -F -F, the Military Religious Freedom Foundation, I always remind them of um, when Benjamin, Benjamin Franklin walked out of the Constitutional Convention, right? He was the rock star of his day, and he was surrounded by his fellow American citizens who said, Mr. Franklin, Mr. Franklin, Mr. Benjamin Franklin, what type of government have all of you bequeathed to us? And do you remember his famous response was, a republic, if you can keep it. Well, ladies and gentlemen that are here tonight and on TV, please help us keep the republic. And thank you for uh, inviting me here tonight. I'll be glad to answer any questions.